Welcome to The Spotlight, the podcast where veterans and military spouses connect and share how their military experience has transformed their lives and their businesses. Here's your host, Bob Lalvin. Hey, this is your host, Bob Lalvin, founder of the Veteran Crowd Network, the network that brings veterans and veteran-led businesses together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. And you are tuning into The Spotlight. Welcome everybody again. Uh, my guest today is Mike Cantwell. Mike is a political reformist. He's a Navy veteran, works now in uh, in the government and government agencies. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Mike lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Mike, welcome to the program. Thank you for stepping into the spotlight. Hey, Bob. Thanks for inviting me. I love your show. Watched a lot of your uh, video podcasts over the last few weeks, and uh, you're doing a great service for Virginia and the rest of the country. Thanks so much, Mike. Hey, let's let's start. I, you know, I, I've been doing some reading. You know, I've gotten involved in uh, in this a little bit, and that's how we met. Um, this will be the third podcast we've had. We had uh, uh, Todd Connor and Eric Bronner on, and so we're talking about this topic a lot this spring. But let's talk about the politics industry. You know, it's really kind of the first time that I've thought about it this way. Let's let's tell everybody what you know. Politics is really an industry in and of itself, isn't it? Well, it's it, a lot of people don't realize this, but it's a really an industry that is just out there to serve the special interests of people that are involved in politics or special interest. So you have uh, a lot of players that are involved in the politics in industry, and, and uh, they do things to uh, you know ensure their their continued uh, survival, that things continue to happen. The people that are really left out of the equation are the average citizens and the average voters. So you have uh, people involved in, in uh, campaigns, people are involved in media, and, and they like the system just the way it is. Um, and then there's the political leaders in the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and they also like the system the way it is. So what we have is uh, a lot of business leaders and others, academics, that are looking at how we can make our political system more responsive to the voters and uh, you know shake things up a little bit be a little disruptive but obviously always within the framework of the constitution and our laws and regulations so uh, there's a lot of mechanisms in our state and federal laws that uh, allow us to make changes to how we how we run campaigns how we elect our elected officials so this is something I've been passionate about for the last uh, five years or so. This is this is really sort of the political industrial complex, you know, and if ever there was a, uh, you know, a perpetual motion machine, this is almost the closest thing to it. How, did, how and when did you get involved in the political reform movement? I mean, what what sparked this? Well, probably back down to uh, 2016, 2017, um, I really was not excited about either uh, Hillary Clinton or, or Donald Trump. Um, I felt the same way, kind of held your nose and pulled the lever, right? Oh, absolutely. And I was uh, I was thinking about voting for Evan McMullen, but I didn't want to be a, him to be a spoiler in the Virginia uh, elections. So he, even though he was my number one choice, I didn't choose him because of the way our electoral system is set up. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we, we saw that, uh, that uh, Donald Trump won the election, then we had his inaugural address, and my jaw dropped at some of the things he said at the inauguration, and also the big, the big deal about how his size of his crowds were, were supposedly bigger than Barack Obama and all that, uh, all that crazy clown show going on with that. And um, I I went onto the internet and Googled the words like centrist and uh, reform and, and came up with this organization called the uh, Centrist Project, which eventually turned into Unite America. And when I went to that first meeting in downtown DC, it felt like I was among 20 of my best friends who all agreed that our political system was broken and that we wanted to do something about it. And then the best part was they had a, a theory of change. This is what we can do. So being a military guy, I'm always about, you know, analyzing a problem and then doing something about it. So 
Um, I joined uh, Unite America, I became the DC chapter leader. We had a whole bunch of meetups and things like that. And then uh, probably the best part was uh, we had some great independent candidates running for governor and, and, and US Senate around the country, people like Neil Simon and Craig O'Deer and uh, Greg Orman and Bill Walker in Alaska and Terry Hayes in, in, um, in Maine and a bunch of other people. And we all convened at this great summit um, called the Unite Summit in August of 2018, where we, uh, we talked about some of these ideas. We talked about theory of change and what we can do about it. And um, I was really inspired by this event. And um, uh, unfortunately, many of the, uh, all of the uh, independent candidates uh, lost because the, the structural forces are so strong against uh, independent candidates. So that, that's my beginning of how I got involved in this. But uh, if you'd like me to, to continue on or if you have any specific well, questions. Well, let, me, let, me set the, let me set the table a little bit. And there's a lot of discussion about let's change, let's do away with the Electoral College as an example. And, uh, you know, the other, other, you know, campaign finance reform, all of these things. And it's generally Congress talking about itself uh, or the federal government talking about itself. But, you know, I think there's a lot of skepticism out there about political reform of that type, because in my opinion, it's a thinly veiled attempt to perpetuate exactly what we are saying is the problem. Am I correct in that? Well, I think it's really, I think the solution to this is, is almost a bottom-up approach where you start at the local and the state level because the states actually have a lot of power to change how we do things. The, the ability to change uh, the electoral college, you'd have to do a constitutional amendment. The last time the constitution was amended was back in 1972. But, but the Electoral College actually works the way that the Founding Fathers intended it to do in a positive way, right? I, I think in a, in, a, in a way it does. Uh, it does give a little bit more power to um, the states and rural areas. Uh, so that was the way it was designed in the beginning was that the uh, founders didn't want to give too much power to the urban interests. They wanted to give a little more power to the rural interest. And I think that resonates uh, well in places like rural Virginia and other places. Right. Uh, so uh, that's not my number one thing. My, there are a lot of people whose number one issue is to, to change the electoral co college. That, to me, that's not going to change things. That there's, there's another big, you know, effort and talking point, and, it, and, and I sort of categorizes it as federalizing state elections. And you were starting to go down the path, you know, that states have enormous power in how they vote. I mean, they could, they could literally draw straws at, you know, noon on that day, and that would be the winner if the states set the law up that way, right? I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious in, in, in that respect, but in, isn't it the states get to determine how their elections are conducted? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm okay with this system because I, I think the closer you are to your representative, the more, uh, the more you can affect change, right? So, so I, can, I can ride my bike to the Arlington County Courthouse and I can meet with, with our five members of the Arlington County Board. I can do the same thing with our school board. Um, I can drive down to Richmond and I can uh, talk to my representatives. So when they're here in Arlington, I can talk to them there. So, um, the best place to influence change is, is not in Washington, but it's at your local level or in the state level. And believe it or not, Zoom has made things, there, there's obviously terrible things with, uh, I'm sorry, uh, COVID has made things uh, bad in many ways, but it's, it's really um, made things a little easier in many ways. So I could I can zoom into a committee meeting in Richmond before I go to work in the morning, right? Uh, we couldn't don't do have that to before. drive down 95 and do right, it. Right. I don't have to drive down 95, right? right. Um, I can speak to my state delegate. I can speak to my um, my state senator. For me to get on Senator Warner's schedule or on, on Tim Kaine's schedule, probably a lot harder than it is to get on my, my state delegate or my state senator's schedule. Before we got to get into the local level solutions that we're going to be talking about in some depth, I've got one other little pet peeve, you know, and 
about a hundred years ago, the 17th Amendment, you know, changed the way we elect senators. It used to be that the state legislatures would be elected and then they would designate the senators to go represent the state of Virginia as an example. Well, in, in 1918, thereabouts, 17th Amendment, they make it a popular election. I think that one thing totally changed the dynamic of the Senate in a, in a negative, negative way. In, in a negative way, right? So, uh, uh, anyway, that's a, that's an editorial comment <laughs> on my part. Let's start talking about the solutions at the local level because there really are two things that um, that are keys to this solution, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you, I can talk about ranked choice voting, is that what you want to? Yeah, we'll do ranked choice voting, and we'll also talk about sort of nonpartisan final five type elections because that's kind of round two, I guess. Or, you know, so so in December of uh, of 2018, I joined this organization called uh, Fair Vote Virginia, and Fair Vote Virginia is a single issue advocacy organization where we advocate for the implementation of ranked choice voting in local, state, and federal elections. Fortunately, I was, I was chosen to be the vice president of um, uh, Fair Vote Virginia, and um, myself and our president, Elizabeth Melson, have been uh, you know, leading the charge on that in Virginia. So th the reason this is so important is that uh, the, state, the state passed a law in 2020, uh, 1103, that gave localities, counties and cities throughout Virginia, the right to uh, change their elections and allow ranked choice voting. And ranked choice voting is, um, the, you know, we can go into, let's go into the why before we go into the how, right? right. So, so why do we want to have ranked choice voting? Well, well, studies show, and ranked choice voting has been around for a long time around the world, is that elections using ranked choice voting, first of all, encourage more people to become candidates. Second, it allows people to rank who their, their choices are. Um, it usually results in a more civil uh, election campaign because candidates are looking for, uh, they want you to choose them first or second when, when you're ranking your votes. So you don't want to demonize your, your uh, opponent too bad because you want their supporters to vote for you second. And also, it usually it will eliminate the spoiler effect. So I was uh, giving an example of the 2016 campaign. With ranked choice voting, you you select who you want. You don't have to do strategic voting where if you vote for this person, then that person might get elected. You just choose who you want. So there's so many benefits in it. Um, it usually uh, opens up for new types of candidates, new types of ideas. And it's really an overall positive uh, thing. So uh, the other thing about ranked choice voting is it's a bipartisan issue, right? And when I say bipartisan, I should say multipartisan because we really want to encourage independents and third parties to participate in the political process. So um, there are uh, throughout, um, right here in Virginia, the Republicans used ranked choice voting to select their gubernatorial nominee last year with Glenn Youngkin, and it was very successful. And uh, many, many uh, liberals, progressives throughout the Commonwealth also support ranked choice voting. Uh, we recently had a bill that was introduced by Delegate Davis down in Virginia Beach, a Republican, um, and it was co-sponsored by Sally Hudson in the Charlottesville area. So there, there's really a lot of people who support ranked choice voting. And to be honest with you, the people that are against it usually have very um, uh, kind of selfish reasons and why they don't rank choice voting. They, they're like, well, I was elected using the old system. I'm comfortable with that. I think I'll win. So therefore I'll oppose ranked choice voting. So that, that's, uh, it's, and also around the country. So in places like Utah, which is a very red state, uh, they have cities and towns using ranked choice voting and very liberal places like San Francisco and Oakland are, are also using ranked choice voting. So it's really, uh, really taking a lot of, uh, it's gaining a lot of momentum throughout the country. You know, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, in, in most of the elections at the six o'clock news hour, you know, I, all I hear is that, you know, if you elect my opponent, the world is going to come to an end. 
it's never about the issues. Does ranked choice voting uh, kind of have the tendency also to get candidates to talk about what they're for instead of how terrible the world's going to be if you don't elect them? Absolutely, because you if you really go negative, you really demonize your opponents, you're not going to get second choice votes from, from the voters. So you really want to talk about the issues and also talk about perhaps what we have in common, right? So I, I agree with my opponent on these two issues, but I disagree with them on these seven issues, right? So you're looking for common ground between the various uh, candidates. But the biggest thing is, is that ranked choice voting will encourage more civil ability in, in elections. And if you listen to voters throughout the Commonwealth, well, the, the toxic nature of our elections is really, really bothering a lot of people. And, um, and this is a, a, a simple or a, a, a already on the books rule way of doing something that we can encourage more civility in our elections. When we come back, we're going to talk about the second piece of the puzzle here, which is nonpartisan final five voting. You're listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Honor, duty, service. At the Veteran Crowd Network, we're focused on our next mission, bringing veterans, veteran-operated businesses, and veteran service organizations together with each other and the resources they need to prosper. That's why we are launching the Veteran Crowd Rewards Program exclusively for our individual and corporate members. Now you can save on travel, restaurants, goods, and services from brands you trust online and at over 900,000 locations nationwide. Find out more today at VeteranCrowdNetwork.com. If you are a veteran, a veteran-operated business, or a VSO, consider the connections the network, the benefits, the engagement, and success of working with other veterans again. The Veteran Crowd Network, you paid a lot of dues to join this club. Okay, welcome back. So Mike Cantwell is my guest. Mike, let's talk about the second piece of the, you know, the political reform movement that's an important solution here, and that's final five voting. Would you explain what that is and why it works? Well, sure, and I'm going to take it a little bit further and, and uh, on another reform that, that I'm really interested in, which is uh, I kind of come up with these bumper stickers. So a bumper sticker is governments should neither uh, fun nor run partisan political uh, primaries. So since the 70s, our government, uh, local, state, federal, have been running partisan primaries. Uh, they really shouldn't be because it, uh, parties are private entities. There's no reason why the, the government should be running an election for a private entity. So part of the reforms uh, laid out by Catherine Gale and, and Michael Porter is that we have we have open final five nonpartisan primaries where you take everyone that wants to run for an office and you put them all on the ballot uh, a month or two before the general election and then the, the the final five vote getters will be moved to the general election for that for that election regardless of party affiliation so you could have five democrats on the ballot Finally, as, as a result of that, and, you know, that would be an extreme, but or, or five Republicans and, right. and uh, California has a little bit of a, a similar system of this, but it's only final two. And so it really is not doesn't get the full power of final five. And in my opinion, you know, with fine and Catherine Gale talks about this great is, is that you you might have a really conservative Republican, then a moderate, moderate Republican, then you might have an independent, you might have a Green Party, then you might have a Democrat. And so you get the whole spectrum of political ideas, political people, and also just different candidates that are on the ballot. So in my mind, it's, it's, it's a great reform that will introduce more competition, new ideas to our, to our political process. And, and uh, 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 boy, we could, we could unpack the, the primary issue. I mean, you know, right now, if somebody gets out of line in the Republican party or in the democratic party, let's primary them, right? It's, it's, it, let's, we'll, we'll go run a primary because such a small percentage of people actually participate in the primary 
you know, it's an easy way to, uh, you know, eliminate and, and get in that single issue person, you know, and, and take away a thorn or burr under the saddle for the party. Right. And, uh, gosh, I, I feel like I'm standing on a soapbox kind of preaching in support of this, but, but in many ways I am. Uh, it, and so that with it, when, when you do rank choice voting though, um, you, you basically have an automatic runoff as well, right? So you don't have to run multiple uh, uh, elections. You, you get a winner. You, you eventually get a 51% uh, winner. That's correct, right? It's not somebody that can win with, you know, 33% of the vote uh, in a five-way election. So, Bob, since we're talking to a lot of veterans here, let me address ranked choice voting and veterans. It's such an important issue when it comes to veterans. So, so think about if you're deployed on a ship or you're in some foxhole in, in Iraq or Afghanistan and you want to participate in our political process. So you, you submit your application for your mail-in ballot. You finally receive your mail-in ballot and then you send it back. Well, there's a, there's a few things that can happen um, because you are far away and you're doing mail-in voting. And, and let me explain how ranked choice voting is going to fix this problem. Think back to the, the 2020 primaries, especially the Democratic primaries. Um, in March and April of those primaries, there were several candidates that dropped out of the race. So if, if you received a ballot uh, that had people's names like Pete Buttigieg or, or uh, Klobuchar on it, you, you could only choose one candidate. So your vote wouldn't count because they had already dropped out of the race. But if you had ranked choice voting, you could have had your second or third choice count in that ballot. Uh, similarly, if you, if you have a, with instant runoff with ranked choice voting, there's no, there's no uh, runoff election, right? So, so it's almost impossible for a military member who's deployed to participate in a runoff election because how quickly that is turned around. So ranked choice voting solves that problem both when candidates drop out of a race, but also solves the problem if there's a runoff. And you've been talking about local, local, local. Let's, let's talk about Virginia specifically, but the idea is literally to get down to the school board election potentially, right? Right. And start that way. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm passionate about people participating in the political process. I am disgusted if people are threatening uh, violence against local school board officials or local uh, county board officials, but there is nothing wrong with you writing your local officials, meeting them for a cup of coffee, and then getting your three minutes of fame at a school board meeting or a board of supervisors meeting. I encourage people to do that because that's the closest you're going to get to your elected officials. So I encourage people to participate in that way, but also throw your hat in, in the ring and be a candidate. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of being an independent candidate. Uh, so, you're, you know, let's talk about that for a second, because you actually uh, you actually have been a candidate. Let's talk about your experience running. Absolutely. Um, Bob, I'll, I'll tell you, I love talking to voters. I really do. I, I mean, I, I never, I didn't realize how much I would enjoy walking through the neighborhoods of Arlington um, and knocking on doors and having conversations with people. It was great. So just to back up a little bit, um, I decided last year to uh, run for Arlington County Board. In Arlington, we call it the County Board and places throughout Virginia usually call them uh, the Board of Supervisors. And um, I decided to run as an independent because I don't feel I'm a Democrat and I'm not a Republican. In Arlington, most people would consider me probably a center-right um, independent. If I was in Southwest Virginia, I'd probably be considered a center-left uh, independent. That's you know, <laughs> the way the political leaves uh, or the winds blow a little bit, right? Um, but it really wasn't that hard, right? So I, I got my 125 signatures. I got my name on the ballot. I filed all the appropriate paperwork. I had a treasurer. I did some fundraising. Um, but primarily, I, I talked to voters. Um, I had six debates. Um, it was They were all online, but I had six debates. And the other good thing about our election was we had the incumbent Dem Democrat. We had, and we had two other independents and we had me. And so 
Um, the voters in November really had a choice on who they, they would elect to uh, county board. There are many, many places throughout Virginia where the voters don't even have a choice. They don't have a, a choice for who's gonna be their, their delegate, their state senator, or even their local official, because there's a lot of apathy out there because most people are dissatisfied with our broken political system. So part of what well, I the, do- the, You know, we got Congress with a, you know- 10%. 10%, uh, or 10 a, a, you know, to 15% approval rating, but we send 90% of them back every election. I mean, who runs a business that way, right? Well, and, and there's a lot of, um, it's sad to say, there's a lot of people that are just completely tuned out. They have a lot of apathy. Even Arlington is one of the most engaged uh, places in the Commonwealth. But even when I was standing at the polls on election day, people were like, well, who are you and what are you running for? I said, oh, I'm running for county board. And people said, well, what's the county board? And, and you know, you think about the amount of taxes you pay to your local government, how important your local government is with your streets, your police, your firefighters, your schools. And there are just so many people who are completely tuned out. I, I really think it's almost like a duty for citizens to uh, be engaged in the political process, you know, one way or another, whatever they feel comfortable with. But it's almost like you're not doing your civic duty by being tuned out of the political process. All, all you veterans out there, we're going to put uh, links to Fair Vote Virginia and Veterans for Political Innovation in the show notes. Mike, I want to shift gears on you in the last couple of minutes here is our conversation because I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your your full time role uh, and talk a little bit about national security and and pick your brain a little bit about what's going on in Ukraine right now. I think I think it'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit about that. Um, what well, can you share? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, it, it really shows you um, what's the importance that government is. Um, Charles Krauthammer, the uh, you know, famous uh, columnist who uh, passed away a few years ago, um, he, had a, he had a great, I just couldn't believe this line that was just so impactful to me. He says, politics is the most important thing. Um, it's the most important thing because if politics isn't right, you have like Stalin and Mao and Hitler and Putin. If politics is right, you have great things that can happen in our country and other countries and everything like that. And these poor, brave people in the Ukraine, they just want to live in their country in peace and prosperity. And they are amazingly brave. They're amazingly articulate about um, why they want to be free, why they don't want to have bombs and missiles dropped on their neighborhoods. And they're doing this all while they're holding a, an infant or, you know, having their son or their husband go off to, to fight war. So that's really what's happening on the global level. But, but here at the local level, um, politics is also the most important thing that you can do because it's about your schools and your police and your firefighters. And um, I really just encourage everybody to get involved in, in one way or another. Uh, because politics is important and veterans are a great messenger for this because so many veterans have given their entire lives um, for others really so for their country for their 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 buddies in in uniform and also for their neighbors and so this is almost the the next thing you can do to be what i call twice a citizen right so you served in the military well, now you can serve your local community, your state, or your country uh, by participating in our political process. You know, I, I look at, at Russia and five years ago, I was saying, gosh, they really are acting like Russians, you know, <laughs> they're acting like Soviets. Um, yep. And, um, you know, as I've had some more time to think about what's going on in Ukraine, uh, you know, I don't think Russia has changed very much in the last 150 years. The people that were leading the country, the czars, and then the, you know, the, the, the Stalins, and now the Putins, I mean, the country itself has a culture that I think tends to have these type of people elevated to positions of leadership. So um, it's, it's not a surprise to me that the Russians see 
the need still as they have for the last several hundred years to have a buffer zone between uh, literally a physical buffer zone between Russia and the West. And um, it's, it's kind of a messed up society that produces the Putins, it produces the Stalins, and, and we're not going to fix it just by replacing Putin with somebody else. I think, I think it's a real long-term cultural issue in Russia. I don't know if you've got a thought on that, but that's kind of my political speech on, on the whole situation, and it is a mess. Well, it, it's given me more, um, more to be proud of to be part of our country and our, um, you know, our representative democracy. And I'm really worried that we're sliding towards uh, um, authoritarianism. And um, it, it's just so... We, we have a whole generation of people that don't have the perspective that I have since I'm in my 60s, you know? Right. And um, we we need to get involved. We need to get, be part of the process. Of course, always legally and never with violence. Uh, that's, that's a, a given in my mind. Um, but we, we need to get involved. And yes, there are, there are bad people out there and you have the, you have North Korea, you have China, you have Russia and these poor people in the Ukraine and Poland, they're, they're so worried that they're going to be uh, invaded again by by Putin and others uh, who, and they just want to be free. They're, they're choosing to be part of, of uh, what the Western world, they're choosing to be part of NATO. And uh, we, we really need to uh, cultivate that relationship. Well, Mike, we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much for stepping into the spotlight. Really interesting stuff. Uh, people can get in touch with you. Uh, we're going to put your LinkedIn profile on the show notes as well. Uh, in, any last word on how they might reach out to you? Have you got a website for uh, Mike Cantwell and, or an email address we'd like to share? We'd be happy to put that on there. Well, my campaign website's still up there if anybody wants to check that out and send me an email through that. Um, also available through LinkedIn. And yeah, if you live in Virginia, please check out Fair Vote Virginia. It's a, it's a great organization and we're, we're really doing, some, doing things in every county and city in Virginia. And so we need volunteers um, all around the Commonwealth to help us with this mission. Thank you, Mike. Well, we, like I said, we'll put uh, links to Fair Vote Virginia uh, in, in the show notes, and I would encourage everybody to check it out. This is a really noble cause. I mean, I, I'll say again, uh, you know, our, our friend and colleague Todd Connor had written an editorial, and that's how I first learned about it. And, and I reached out to Todd and, and uh, you know, have gotten uh, engaged in the limited way that I can. But uh, I am I'm really encouraged by what you guys are doing. Uh, it just makes sense. Let's all the veterans, let's get together, bring your friends and family, show them this idea. Uh, I think this is a really positive uh, political reform effort. So thank you so much. You've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Our guest has been Mike Cantwell. Mike, I'm going to throw out an Army Bravo Zulu to you for your performance today. Thank you for stepping into the Spotlight. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.